Network to the world. Subscribe now to the Hot 97 YouTube channel. It's Ebro in the Morning with Laura Stiles and Rosenberg. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Ebro, Laura, and Rosenberg. And on the program today, Eddie Wang. What's up, Eddie Wong? How you doing, sir? What's up? Thank you for having me, guys. How you Always doing, man? Thank you I'm for good. coming on the I'm program. Mm -hmm. Yo, look, man, um, your new movie, Out Boogie. Um, you know, a lot of people talking about it. Great soundtrack, gotta say. Uh, got Pop Smoke in the movie. R.I.P. to Pop Smoke. I would love to hear the, the the origin story of of this movie Boogie and how it all came together, man. Well, really, what it was when I was seventeen, man. I, I uh, you know, I, uh, the the violence in my family is well documented and fresh off the boat. And I definitely struggled with that growing up. And uh, I watched Good Will Hunting at my aunt's crib. And I remember watching and being like, I don't have that much in common with these dudes from Boston. But the way that they addressed domestic violence, the way that they addressed Will's character coming of age, um, it really affected me. And I realized how powerful film could be that if you talked about something um, that you know, a kid like me could watch and, and feel less alone and feel understood. And I just said to myself that when I when I grow up, I'm going to make a movie that I think other kids can relate to as well that, that make them feel a little less alien. So um, that idea to make a film really started then when I was 17. It seems a, a lot of uh, your storytelling, too, and, and it's so important right now, um, you know, and it has been for a while. And you've always talked about uh, being Asian in America and trying to find an avenue um, to tell the or you know the immigration story um, and and make people understand that your experience as an Asian American is a just like other immigrants and b dealing with the same racism and issues that other groups are dealing with. Yeah, um, you know that I didn't sleep last night because. There was the shooting um, outside Atlanta, and it really bugged me out because while I've, I've faced a lot of racism in my life, whether verbal or physical, um, I don't think I've witnessed anything like this in America because our parents tell us as immigrants coming to this country, you know, just bow your head down, you know, respect your elders, don't rock the boat. And, and the strategy, I think, for a lot of Asian immigrants in America has been to follow the rules, don't upset anybody, don't draw attention to yourself. And if, if we quiet and, and we keep our heads down, then no one's going to bother us. Um, and props to our parents. I think it has worked in some ways. But as the second generation um, grows up in this country, you start to realize that it is impossible to live here and not participate in the American experiment and not speak out. And we're at a crossroads here as a community where we are under attack and, and we need help. We need allies. We need people to understand us. We need people to see us as human. And um, it is absolutely the time to, to come out of our shells, to come out of our Chinatowns, come out of our Korea towns, raise our hands, stand up and say, yo, we American too. And um, we deserve to be protected and we need your help. Do you have any like specific theories um, on what's going on right now? Not that this hasn't always been going on, um, but what we're seeing with the rash of hate crimes towards Asians all over the country at this moment. Obviously, we know Donald Trump played a, a part. But when you're talking about with people and your family and loved ones, do you guys what, what kind of thoughts are coming out there? Ideas you might have about what's happening here? Well, you know, it's a, it's a really good question, Rosenberg, is I, I feel like there's always been hate towards Asians, at least for me, right? I grew up in Florida, Orlando, Central Florida, to be exact. And, you know, there were always kids calling me Ching Chong Eddie Wong or, you know, wanting to fight, wanting to steal stuff off me. But, you know, it was never this coordinated. I don't remember ever seeing headlines saying 3,800 attacks against Asians this year. I mean, that's an extraordinary number. It's, it's kind of scary. And, um, you know, for me and, and from the numbers and the articles I'm reading, it seems to be coming um, post Donald Trump's comments about, you know, the China virus or the Kung flu. And uh, it, 
it does seem to be that people are very frustrated with the pandemic, rightly so. Um, Asian Americans are frustrated with it just as much. Um, but I do have a feeling that there has been a rise in these attacks because people want a scapegoat for their frustration and what's going on. And, and for the 500,000 people that have died of coronavirus, but it is not the fault of Asian Americans. Um, it, we, have, we have nothing to do with this. And we still don't know the real cause of this virus and we won't know f- for quite some time. So I just urge people not to act on that frustration and not to take it out on Asian Americans. Last night, the, oh, well, sorry, I, I'll just say last night, you know, there was this post going around, a fake Facebook post of the the suspect saying, you know, why he was upset and why he did it. It was a fake post. And I just think that there is a lot of fake news going on. I posted it myself because a lot of reputable sites had it up, reputable people sent it to me. But a few hours later, it was it was debunked and, and, and I figured out it was fake. I took it down. But man, I, I really think fake news just has a lot to do with this, Rosenberg. And well, there, but there is precedent. Fake news. There, there is precedent, though, Eddie, in America, for this treatment of Asian Americans. Uh, when you go back to World War II and internment camps, and America blaming Asians that lived in America or treating them as suspects uh, when there was conflict with Japan. And, you know, it wasn't just, you know, I hear stories from Asian friends of mine. I'm from California. I grew up in Northern California where a lot of the internment camps were uh, in Sacramento. And, you know, they, you know, it wasn't just Japanese uh, people that got their doors knocked on and their homes taken. It was all, it was just Asians. And so in this nation, there's precedent for this type of behavior from the government specifically, but also from the citizens who take the word of the government and just start to lash out at anyone that fits the description. Uh, Same thing when you talk about uh, Muslims during 9-11. And then you have people of the Sikh faith who wear turbans also. They got hate because they look a certain way and it was just like okay you fit the description and we can keep going to different groups you know whether it's people of the jewish faith whether obviously black people um and to your point you know it's it's not just america it's not just keep your head down follow the rules and nobody's gonna bother you that's just not the fabric of this nation Yeah, in my lifetime, I haven't seen a coordinated effort against Asian Americans like this. But you're right. Like, there's the Chinese Exclusion Act, where we weren't even allowed into this country. You know, we were brought in to work the gold mines and then the railroads. And then there was the internment camps. And then in the 80s, you know, when Japanese automakers were a threat to, you know, the the economy, uh, Vincent Chin happened. You know, right. And uh, an Asian auto worker was attacked and killed. And and so, you know, it, it, it ebbs and flows with the politics of this country. But you're absolutely right. Ebro is is that all of us, you know, it, it, it we're, we're all at some point the scapegoat for something in this country and under attack. I think one of the important conversations that I, I've seen you, you know, uh, respond in comments is, um, you know, when when. Black Lives Matter, when all of us were being extremely vocal about what's happening, you know, I saw you be very vocal about it. But I also see, you know, and it's a sensitive time because, you know, uh, I saw people saying, hey, but, you know, but black folks are attacking us and they, they don't stand with us, you know, and, and I've seen it happens with Latinos it happens because l- let's face it, white supremacy is embedded in to all groups. Right. But I, I think it's important that you continue to talk about like the unity and educate people on how many times have black and Asian leaders stood together to fight against the same racism that's affecting us today. Yeah. You know, thank you for mentioning that. And, um, I always tell a story is the first time I was ever called a chink was by another black student in third grade. And I never once, felt or thought it was like the black community attacking me. It was an isolated incident. And I could see it in this kid's face, even as a third year, third grader. And I wrote about this in Fresh Off the Boat. We were the only two kids of color in our class. 
And we were always being laughed at and we were always being pitted against. And from a very young age, my personal feeling was, yo, it's like the barbar- they're playing the barbarians against themselves. You know, if you get the black kid and the Asian kid to argue and snap on each other and laugh at each other, then it's entertainment for the rest of us. Mm. And I felt that way. And, um, you know, it happened because we were both at the back of a lunch line waiting to microwave food for lunch. And he threw me to the ground and called me a chink. And I fought back. But I never once felt like I was fighting against anyone more than that that one individual because the people pushing us down every day were the other white kids in class. And that's how I see it, you know, with 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 all of us living together in lower income neighborhoods side by side as well. You know, like I had aunties that had Chinese fast food bulletproof restaurants and who are most of your customers? They're black, they're Latino, because all of us have to live in these neighborhoods that are low income. Well, and to build on that, Eddie, what people aren't sophisticated often enough to understand in that relationship that you articulated right there is the access to income to start a business. When immigrants of Asian descent come to this country, sometimes there's, there's access to capital that black people haven't had. And so black people in those communities and walk with me here, Eddie, because I know, you know, this frustration, black people are pointing at Asian business owners saying you're taking from our community and you're not giving back when real when the real truth is black entrepreneurs can't even access the capital to start businesses because the banks won't give them loans. And so once again, the infrastructure pits these groups against each other in the financial system. Yeah. And I mean, if you look at the history of this country, uh, the the initial people coming into these neighborhoods and, and, and selling their goods, it was Irish, then it was Italian, then it was Jewish, then it was Asian, always selling to black and Latino people who did not have access, who were always on the bottom. And so, you know, I, I, I talk about this a lot. Like I used to just sit at the at the Bulletproof Chinese spot on Fulton Street And I'd see the kids, you know, they may buy a drink from somewhere else and then they go to the Chinese spot and ask for cups and ice. And at first I was like, yo, why you always come to the Chinese spot, ask for cups for cups with ice and don't buy anything. And the kids would tell me because John's nice. We know that John's going to give us the cups and ice. And I'm like, but you buying it from the white store and then come on over here getting the cups and ice. And like, they won't give it to us. And then the owner would explain to me, he's like, yeah, they may not buy anything today. But they may come back the next day and buy something or the day after that and buy something. But if I'm nice to them and they can always get cups and ice, then like we develop a rapport, we develop a relationship. And that was an interesting thing for me to understand and see even at a young age. You know, I used to think that they would just go ask John for cups and ice because he was Asian and he was he was weaker. You know, Mm. but it was that they felt a kinship with him and like, yo, we can ask John for cups and ice because that other lady across the street is not going to give it to us. You know, I grew up in Northern California, as our, as I said earlier, just uh, last month, there was a big rally of all the black activists and black uh, grassroots organizations in Oakland alongside the Asian organizations. And my experience growing up was, you know, Latinos and blacks and Asians and Pacific Islanders all together, you know, uh, as a part of grassroots organizations and against oppression and white supremacy. And that was a Bay Area experience. And then I hear from my friends in L.A., it's a very it's a very segregated Asian, black, Latino experience. Laura, you're you're in L.A. and you you the unity thing is kind of like ebbs and flows. And here in, in New York, it feels similar where the unity thing ebbs and flows. It's not kind of built into the culture. And maybe that's because of the history of of New York where you had neighborhoods and these kind of immigrant factions. This is a Jewish neighborhood. This is an Italian neighborhood. This is a, you know, a Chinese neighborhood. This is Korean. This is Jamaican. This is, you know what I mean? It was kind of broken up. And New York, while they called it a melting pot, it was more like a, what did they say? It was more like a tossed salad. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> you know, do you, as, as somebody who's, you know, been on the East Coast also, Eddie, for a long time, how do you, uh, how do you see the unity coming together here on the East Coast? It's 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 much more segregated. And, uh, you know, the star of our film, Boogie Taylor Takahashi, he's a Bay Area kid. And he would read a lot of the stuff I wrote and, and ask me a lot of questions about how I grew up. And we came to the same conclusion, Ebro, that the Bay Area is very, very futuristic in terms of 
black, Latino, Asian, and, and even like LGBTQ solidarity, you know, um, there's something in the water there, you know, like there's something in the water for point guards like Gary Payton and Jason Kidd. And there, there, there's something in the Dame water. Dame Lillard. For don't forget Dame Lillard. Yeah. Dame, Dame time, you know, homie dropped 50 last night, but, um, yeah, man, it, it is, it is different. Y'all got to grow up different. And, um, you know, even when he was studying the character Boogie, I had to give him a lot of stories about what it felt like being the only Asian kid in class, um, being made fun of just just for being Asian because he didn't experience that as much. He said he went to schools at times that they were almost predominantly Asian in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. you know? And, and um, I, I mean, I, it's like it feels like a wonderful fantasy world to grow up Asian in the Bay. But, you know, they, it's some of the strongest you know, members of our community have come from there and, and they have really amazing voices that lead us because they've been able to grow up in America, not fragmented. They, you know, they, they have a whole vision of themselves. Well, and it's interesting too, my dad and my mom, my mom being a Jewish woman, my dad uh, active alongside uh, black activist group in the Panthers and things in the Bay. There was also Asian activist groups in the late 60s and 70s in the Bay Area. Like it was... You know, there was leadership, I think, early. It's a part of the fabric. Um, and so maybe that contributes to where things are at today is that people have seen it uh, and, and have lived it there where you have this unity uh, across cultural lines. And they were also in those internment camps you talked about. Exactly. You know, so, so they, they have seen the oppression. A lot of like, like the approach that a lot of us have on the East Coast is the one be quiet stand in line, don't rock the boat. But, you know, what's happening now is going to wake up an entire generation of Asian people, and I hope we sustain this participation in American politics. Um, can we talk for a little bit with regard to Boogie about how the Pop Smoke uh, situation came to be and what your relationship was like with him, how talented he was? Tell us a little bit about Pop Smoke. Yeah, Pop, Pop is phenomenal. Um I mean, Pop is hands down the most talented person I ever met. And, um, you know, I, I still think about Pop every day. I still listen to his music. And um, I, I met Pop um, I met Pop because my best friend and executive producer, Raph, is really close with his manager, Stephen Victor. And okay. they'd always been in touch. And, and the role opened up in the film. And Pop came to my crib. We started playing basketball. And just from jump, I just saw the – the energy and the, and the star power in him and the fearlessness. And, and that was something that I, I really gravitated towards with pop was that any challenge I gave him, he never got scared. He never hesitated. He was like, I right, big dog. I'm, I'm going to try that. I'm going to do that. And, and it, it was, it was incredible. Um, he would rather just jump in, make the mistake, come back, talk to me, try it again. And there was never a fear if he messed up to get back up and, um, I've never seen fearlessness like that in, in anybody. How it, it must have been really crazy for you to find out the the news. How how difficult was it for you as you know someone who'd been working with him and as so on a personal friend level, but then also as a filmmaker now. Uh, what was that experience like? Uh, that that last day was that that entire last day just felt off and you know like from from the moment he posted the f i mean I, I i texted his him and mike like as soon as i saw the photo on instagram I was like yo y'all are in la and then you know i you know it, it was just it was just odd to see the photo and then i was like yo we should play basketball they're like no nah, we're gonna have a party at the house and i didn't think much of it after then and i woke up and I woke up early on the West Coast. I think it might have been like 6, 630. And, and I rolled over and I saw my phone. It was just tons of text messages like, are you OK? Are you OK? And, and you know, what happened? And the only other time I've felt that is the, the morning I found out Tony Bourdain died. And, and without even reading the text, I just knew. I, I, I just knew something bad happened. And... Um, Uh, yeah, I, I just went to the boxing gym and started hitting stuff. That's a that sounds That's like a way a, to get the energy a, out. Yeah, a good a, way to Eddie, go. Eddie, Eddie, I'm, I'm watching you talk today. How are you doing, man? Like with you know, obviously everything in the news, and then now watching you talk through this pop smoke thing. This is a lot. 
Um, yeah. It's yeah, a lot no, to it's, deal with. How are you doing? Uh, <laughs> I mean, like, I know I'm good. You know, I, I know I should be happy, but I mean, I didn't sleep last night, you know, because I was just trying to get information. Like when, when the news hit last night, I was just trying to, I was hoping that it wasn't racially motivated. You know, you see this and I saw that six of the eight victims were Asian. I just kept saying to myself, like, maybe, maybe it's not racially motivated. Maybe, maybe they just got caught up. But when you look at it, it's, it's three locations, Asian businesses, you know, 60, you know, three, four, 75% of the victims is Asian. I, I was just refreshing the news over and over. I didn't really sleep. And I knew I had to talk to you guys and, you know, it's, it's, it's rough, man. I've done, I think like 130, 150 interviews talking about pop. It, it's tough, but, um, you know, I feel like, I feel like my community needs me to, to speak out on these issues. And, and I do sit personally at the intersection of a lot of these things. So, um, it's it's tough personally, but it's work I got to do. You know, I signed up for this. Um, when when uh, and maybe f for the audience, you know, um, not everybody connects when an incident like what took place in Atlanta happens, right? Like, but I know for you know for Black folks, for Jewish folks, and you know for Asian folks, when you know it, when you know it's and Latinos, when you it, when you know it's racially motivated, the LGBTQ community, when you know it's gender or sexual orientation is the motivation, you see yourself in the incident, and that's the that's the weight, right? Like it's like I can't run from that. Yeah, like there's no also, hiding. I, yeah, it might also be you know I've been in situations where. Someone pulled a gun on me before. Someone tried to jack me before. Someone's tried to jack my friend before. And, and you know, it's just, you, you do see yourself in it. You see a reflection of yourself in it, Ebro. And, you know, like recently, the, like about three weeks ago, there was an incident, you know, that my friend just got away from. So it, it's tough, man. Like it, it, it's, it's really tough on a personal level, but you feel for these victims and then you feel for your community as well if you've been through it. Do you have a uh, coming up after this uh, movie Boogie? Um, you've been in the TV game, uh, you've done the documentary thing, uh, the book thing. Um, now, where where does it go for Eddie going forward? Right, like you you've been somebody that we've had the pleasure of knowing for some time, and getting to this point of putting out a movie, you know, um, at this level, I'm sure is a is a is a dream come true. Where does it go after this? You know, I, I've been working on um, the HBO Max animated show Chinos I got. And that is also about Asian kids and Latino kids growing <laughs> up in the Boyle Heights neighborhood yeah. on the intersection of like East L.A. So it's I always been talking about these things and they start to pop up in the news. But that's just an a, a important relationship I wanted to talk about as well. But from the perspective and view of like 13 year old, 14 year old kids. Mm. I, and is that out now? Is that on HBO Max now? Oh no, we're we're in the. I finished the pilot. They've Got you it. know they've accepted the pilot, and we're about to animate it and get into all that. So Yo. it's gonna be. I still. I'm, I'm excited. Yeah. And how did the you know the the TV show Fresh Off the Boat, which was obviously based on your book, um, how did that the relationship with ABC? How did that go? How did that end up? <laughs> It was cool. I, I didn't end up working on the show after the first season. Right. So uh, that that's kind of what happened. And then it's famously, I, I wrote a New York Magazine article about what happened. And, and we just, we didn't see eye to eye. You know, they didn't want to talk about the things that I've been talking about in my work and Boogie and, and that I will be talking about in Chino's. And, and we just never saw eye to eye on that. So they was trying to go to Disney and you wanted to go too real. Yeah, and and really, what that show did was it, it it stripped out a lot of the pain and struggle of being an Asian in America, and and they sold that show on entertainment. And it was like, look at this funny kid, this funny Chinese kid that's in a hip hop, and they really kind of devalued that connection to Black culture. And uh, I wasn't here for it, you know. I, I didn't really want to participate in that show. I respect that. I respect that a yeah. lot. Yo, man, Eddie Huang, man. Legend in the game. Continue to do your great work. You know what I mean? Sending you love and light on, on this tough time in history in America, man. And just keep doing the work, bro. Thank keep you, man. Keep doing the I work. It's, it's valuable. Thank you.
Thank you for having me. Go go Washington football team, Rosenberg. Yep. <laughs> are, you, are you putting together a group Love. to to force Daniel Snyder to to sell the team? What's up? <laughs> I mean, I feel like the news is forcing him out on his own anyway. You know, like that that dude's got to go. He's been needed to go for a very long time. So. I know. I, I do appreciate that the Washington Post, which by the way, interestingly, is now owned by Jeff Bezos, seems to be. Yeah. They seem to have a concentrated interest in getting Snyder to sell. So maybe we have a chance. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, may, may yeah, Yo, I, I, I got a news flash for y'all, which I can yeah. see happening. What? Bezos is so rich. And having a newspaper and a football team in the same town. Then there was an article I read the other day that Amazon has hired like 200 plus former government employees to work for Amazon and help them lobby the government so that they could avoid certain things. <laughs> I got news. If it, if it comes out that Bezos is buying the Washington football team, I think the government going to have something to say about it. <laughs> you wow. never know. Yo, serious. Serious. Wow. I just hope we get a name and a quarterback this year. That, that's, I don't think that's too much to ask. <laughs> nah, keep, keep the football team for one more. It worked out for you guys last year. I don't hate, yeah. the, I don't hate the name the football team. I actually don't really? hate it. Yeah, I think I'd be okay with it. Let me put it this way. What would you rather have, the Washington football team or some like nickname that you really don't connect with at all? What about changing team to club? Would that work for you, Eddie? Oh, yeah. Club, club would be better for me. Because team just felt like the the like placeholder like on Madden like when you need to name your like fantasy team Facts. you know so I was like club club feels better to me because at least or it stands back. out and you know they're the only club in football yeah yeah or just bring back the bullets just call them the bullets you know the, yeah uh, you should suggest that I think we can make get some real traction <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, Eddie, love, bro. Thank Everybody, you, go check Thanks, out the Eddie. movie Boogie. Where can people watch Boogie right now? In 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 theaters now, and then it's gonna be on VOD in a week. So uh, I believe they already announced that this morning, but my head was in the other news, so I forgot the date. My bad. But I think it's next week. It's on Apple, iTunes, Amazon, Fandango, all those places that you would buy on VOD. There Boom. it is, man. So, Eddie. Thanks, Eddie. Thanks, love, Eddie. bro. Keep going. Take care, guys. Have All a right, good man. one. Peace. Peace, yo.